on this week's podcast, which is available on audio and video, I'm doing a workshop on single object haiku. A workshop that should help you when Poetry P's next reading period opens. I hope you'll find today's podcast full of inspiring haiku from the masters right through to the present day. Hello, I'm Patricia, and this is the Poetry Peacast. If you enjoy what you're about to hear, do go to wherever you get your podcasts or our YouTube channel. That's Poetry P. Like, share and comment on the work we're doing here. It would be great to see some more five-star reviews. Thank you very much. Now, shall we travel the haiku and senryu world together? Let's. I've been doing a lot of reading and there's a section in a book called Early Modern Japanese Literature, an anthology, 1600 to 1900, titled Single Object Poetry. You know, it's something I've been wondering about, and so I was very, very excited when I came upon it, because not too many people write about it. Let me read you how it opens. In response to Hiyoriku's emphasis on the combination poem and his claim that combining separate topics or images was Basho's central technique, Kaiorai, another of Basho's disciples, argued that although combining was certainly important, it did not take precedence over other techniques, and that Basho also composed single object poems, poems which focused on one topic and flowed smoothly from start to finish, without the leap or gap found in the combination poem. Now, why should we care what either of those two gentlemen have to say? Well, they were both of the Basho School of Poetry. Both were included in Basho's top 10 disciples. Imagine, top 10. Both were leading proponents of his school after his death, being some of the first Basho's disciples to record his teachings. And I think that Basho may well have died in a home owned by Kaiorai, the poet who believed in the single object poem. So they were both close to Basho while he was alive, and yet on the surface they have two different opinions on his technique or techniques. Perhaps it's Kaioriku, whose opinion holds sway today, because he believed that the combination poem, a poem that combined two or more different topics, was the central te- technique of the Basho style, and that this technique was a superior technique. Superior, that is, to the technique which created a single object hoku, as it would have been at the time. Kaiorai took a different view. He thought that combining disparate images was an easier technique, a technique particularly suitable for beginners. To look at his thinking, it was that beginners would be able to compose many verses using this process, you know, different images put together. That it gave a poet greater scope to be original. And you know what? I think he could be right. Let's see what you think when you try to write for this topic. I believe you can do it. Now, going back to Kaiorai, he went as far as to say that all hoku are single object poems, that they all focus on a single object. And I'm going to give you a few examples. And here's the first one. From Basho. Fleas, lice, a horse passing water by my pillow. Fleas, lice, a horse passing water by my pillow. Now, I suppose you could argue that this is a multiple of images, but to me, it's all about where Basho finds himself, where he's sleeping. 
and the scene around his pillow. But the effect it has on me is quite complex. There are quite a few emotions within that. I mean, there's disgust. Well, there is for me anyway, because I think it's quite horrible. There's a little bit of sorrow and pity because this man, this wandering monk has found himself in such a nasty place. And yet there's a little bit of wonderment too, because that's life, isn't it, really? And now I have something a little bit more up to date by Gary Snyder from 1952. Something that William J. Higginson describes as a short hoku-like poem. This morning, floating face down in the water bucket, a drowned mouse. This morning, floating face down in the water bucket, a drowned mouse. Gary Snyder. And again, to me, this is ostensibly about the mouse, although, like all poems, its effect is more complex. So those two examples might support Kaiori's idea that all hoku are single object. But wait, falling snow, hairs of the willow turned white. Falling snow, hairs of the willow turned white. Shigiorai. The wash basin's drip dripping gives way to crickets chirping. The wash basin's drip dripping gives way to crickets chirping. And this one's by another of Basho's disciples, Poncho. So, a quick reading of a few haiku tomes suggests that Kaiorai might not be right. Hoku are not all single object poems. I wonder, could it be that there was a little bit of feuding going on and that Kaiorai was trying to establish himself as the rightful successor to Basho? I suspect there was quite a scrum for that role. And then I wonder also, and it would be remiss of me not to point it out, that Hoku and Haiku are a little bit different. Hoku being the first poem of a sequence, whereas what we now know as haiku are standalone poems. Does that make a difference to the way Kaiorai might have thought about them if he'd known what the future held? So now, having disproved Kaiorai's claim, let's examine some of his examples, the ones he gives to illustrate his point that hoku are single object focused. And just because his point is wrong, or at least we've disproved it, it doesn't negate the other point he made, that there's merit to single object hoku, or haiku as we would now call them. Scratching its beautiful face, the pheasant's spurs. Scratching its beautiful face, the pheasant's spurs. By Kikaku, another of the disciples. So on the one hand, you could say this is a combination. It, com it combines a face with the pheasant spurs, which is a fair point. But I find that this is not a combination of unrelated images. Plainly, at least to me, it's all about the pheasant. If you disagree, of course, you know where to find me to make the counter argument. As we study this and the examples that follow, you'll see that even when you write a single object poem, you can still have two or more images. Two or more images about the same thing. What we're trying to avoid is a simple run on sentence. No. That won't do at all, but we will cover that later. Shall we have a look at some techniques that will help you out? The first technique, reversing expectations. 
warmly wrapped in its feathered robe, feet of the wild duck. Warmly wrapped in its feathered robe, feet of the wild duck. And that's by the master himself, Basho. On the face of it, a single object poem written about a duck. Yet, this poem illustrates beautifully the depth of meaning we should be aspiring to, and of course, the technique of reversing expectations. This poem, as tradition dictates, has a seasonal element. In classical poetry of Basho's time, the wild duck was to be found floating on a winter pond. This image was associated with cold, coldness. But he's turned it on its head, reversed our expectations. Basho's duck is warm, warmly wrapped in its feathered robe. Next technique is to Riavaza. It's something we spent a lot of time studying, so I expect you will be absolutely on the money when it comes to this technique. Sharana gives us this example from Basho again. Spring gradually takes shape, moon and plum blossoms. Spring gradually takes shape, moon and plum blossoms. We should address one thing straight away. How many times have you heard people, including me, telling you not to include more than one seasonal word? Countless times, I bet. Yet here we have two clear seasonal references and the moon, of course. I think the moon needs a signifier when you use it. You can name it for the month that you, you're using it in, so strawberry or hunters, etc. Or you can include it, as Basho has done here, with other seasonal references, so you know where the moon is in terms of the season. Without that signifier, at least in the Sajiki I use, moon, on its own, is autumn, all season long, autumn. For me, this poem is all about spring. Combining these images, Basho gives us a sense of movement. And perhaps I should explain what I mean here. In the first part, spring gradually takes shape. We're clearly being guided to understand a movement of time. And we can all pretty much imagine what he means when he speaks of spring taking shape, can't we? For instance, in my garden, the grass at the moment is greening up. It's spring. It no longer has that washed out yellowy colour it had when the snow melted. I'm delighted to see the primroses budding and, I know you're all desperate to know, an annual update on my daft magnolia. Yes, it is, as always, blooming too early. We've had snow and frost this week. Magnolia blossoms, as if late frost never happens. Magnolia blossoms, as if late frost never happens. That's one of mine, and it was in Presence issue 73. In this poem, late frost, when combined with the magnolia blossoms, both indicate spring. And hopefully, if you've been here for all my sagas about the magnolia, the poem will make you smile with its touch of sardonic humour. But I also hope you can see the suggestion, suggestion of the passing of time. The magnolia blossoming is a yearly event, as is, in my case, the late frost. And so the globe turns, time continues. And I'll just go back to those seasonal references. This time, I'm not going to worry too much if you want to use a couple of them, but use them wisely and don't combine seasons. Let's not go there. Another technique we've looked at in the past 
is Chicky's sketch of life. To illustrate, weirdly, I'm going to read something of Busson's. The spring sea, all day long, back and forth, back and forth. The spring sea, all day long, back and forth, back and forth. Now, as I said, we all know that phrase, the sketch of life comes from Shiki, who was writing his poetry and his theories of haiku at a much later date than Busan was alive. Nonetheless, that's how I would describe this poem. And maybe also, as Otsuji suggests, it's a union of poet with nature. In this poem, Busan is able to suggest a universal feeling and experience that will resonate with most of us. The movement of the sea. And here's another one from the Japanese canon, another sketch of life focusing on a single object. And again, I can feel the passing of time. Floating away the turnip leaves and how swiftly they go. Floating away the turnip leaves, and how swiftly they go. Takahara Kayoshi. Next is something we should always try to do whenever we write. To look beyond the boundaries. To try and describe something in an original way. Something that when your neighbour looks over the castle wall, he won't notice. And your writing of it will come as a surprise. And I thought this one would illustrate that quite nicely. Their way of filling the whole night, round eyes of the owl. Their way of filling the whole night, round eyes of the owl. Foster Jewel. More aesthetics next. And again, we've looked at this in the past with Stanford M. Forrester, Eugen. I'll put a link in the show notes to Stan's work. One of, one of the definitions I particularly liked that Stan gave us was by D.T. Suzuki. And he said, Yugen does not, as has sometimes been supposed, have to do with some other world beyond this one, but rather with the depth of the world we live in, an awareness of the universe that triggers emotional responses too deep and mysterious for words. When I read this poem, that's the effect it has on me. A lily stalk, concentrating all its might into one flower bud. A lily stalk, concentrating all its might into one flower bud. Yumiyashu Fusai. Now, there's something I don't do often enough myself in my poetry, and I really must try harder to explore the senses. Grasping the warmth of a sparrow and letting it go. Grasping the warmth of a sparrow and letting it go. Grasping the warmth of a sparrow and letting it go. Ipikiro. Epikiro has combined a number of senses within this poem, which concerns that little sparrow. I think it comes close to a run-on sentence, which of course we don't want to see. But there are options to put a cut. I feel one at the end of line two most strongly, but maybe there's one after grasping. Grasping the warmth of a sparrow and letting it go. 
grasping the warmth of a sparrow and letting it go. My mind changes as I read it time and again. Let me know what you think. Can you hear the cut? Where would you put it? Anyway, to go back to the poem again and the, these senses that it uses, it's visual. You can see it happening. I can feel the warmth of the sparrow. Can you? And I don't know about you, but I can feel the movement of the bird as it is let go. Perhaps I can even feel the fluttering of its wings and the associated movement of air. Now, I can't end the podcast without pointing you towards the possibilities of Senryu. Let me give you a couple of examples, which I hope are going to inspire you. The shadow in the folded napkin. The shadow in the folded napkin. Cor van den Heuvel. An empty elevator opens, closes. An empty elevator opens, closes. Jack Kane. Now, I hope I've given you some poetry today that will inspire you to write your own and I hope submit to Poetry P when our reading period opens for the topic of single object poetry. May the 1st to the 15th, save the date. So just to reiterate what we're looking for, it's a poem about one single object. It will often have two parts, even if it's separated by the tiniest of cuts and the shortest pauses, like this poem. The crow, without saying a word, flew away. The crow, without saying a word, flew away. Ozaki Hosai. Is this a run-on sentence? I think there's a short pause after the crow, at least when I read it. I do have that little bit of space to insert myself and to think about the poem. And you know, there have been so many crow poems in the canon of haiku, but I can't help but think that this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, which to me gives an added dimension to the poem. What we're not looking for are run-on sentences. I wrote this next poem so I could illustrate what the team doesn't want to see. On the promenade, a one-legged seagull eats a rotting chip. On the promenade, a one-legged seagull eats a rotting chip. I don't think that would ever get published because it's a run-on sentence. It is a single object poem. Hopefully, despite the presence of the chip, you can see it's all about the seagull. And in case any of you think it's nonsense, this seagull was alive and well and eyeing up my dinner near Cape Town. There is no gap for anyone to insert themselves into this poem when reading it, to insert any ideas. All I've done is tell you exactly what's going on. So much so that the thing that really struck me about the gull, its one leg, is somewhat lost, isn't it? I hope you'll find this one, in which I hope there's a little bit of space for you to stop and think, to take a breath, is a better effort and not a run-on sentence. A seagull eats a frosted chip, its one leg. A seagull eats a frosted chip, its one leg. There's a pause indicated by the M-dash, which also makes sure that you don't think the chip has got one leg. And I hope this M-dash, this pause, 
adds a little bit of tension to the poem. And you'll notice that I changed the chip from rotting to frosted this time round, hoping that it illustrates better the desperation of the poor old gull eating cold chips in the cold of winter. So, in conclusion, single object haiku are possible in the modern haiku as well as the hoku. Kaiorai may well have had a point that they are harder to write. You have to take more care with your imagery to make sure you don't create that run-on sentence without tension and without space for your reader. And also that you're just not repeating yourself. So to recap, the techniques we looked at today were reversing expectations, Toria Vaza, a sketch of life, looking beyond the boundary, you know, over the castle wall. Yugen, exploring the senses, and Senryu. I hope you'll find the techniques useful and inspirational, but you may have other methods of writing, so feel free to use them if they achieve our goal, a single object haiku. And you probably got this message, but just in case, a big no-no would be a run-on sentence, a poem without a pause or a cut, unless, of course, you're writing senryu when the cut's not necessary. So whatever you're going to write, let your mind fly freely. Write something original, something that will make the team go, oh yes, I like that. Something with a little space for your reader to insert themselves. Something which is authentically you. Thank you so much for joining me today for this workshop. You'll find the prompts in the show notes for this podcast. And of course, you'll see the slides on the YouTube version of this workshop. Our ISA and Busan members will get an email with the contents of this PCAST. See? That's what you get for supporting Poetry P. I know not everyone can afford a membership or a coffee, so don't put pressure on yourself. But if you can, I'd be very grateful if you can donate in some way. Just imagine the reading and the books I had to purchase just to put this podcast together. So don't forget, if you enjoy this podcast, go to wherever you get your podcasts or to YouTube like our content, and importantly, share it with other people, other haiku friends. Let them know that we're all about the English language Japanese short form. I hope you enjoy this podcast and the video workshop that goes with it. And whatever thoughts you have, just send me some feedback. A little email would be lovely. And check out the show notes get writing those submissions for May, our next reading period. Or if you're not coming to this in time, have a look at our submissions pages and see what we're up to. So until I see you next week, keep writing. And if there's something missing from the show notes, if you're not sure of anything, you know where I am, send me an email. Ciao.